Hi everybody, welcome back to AZD DWF channel. Some time ago I bought two Atari Asteroids arcade PCBs. They were quite abused as shown in a previous video. Initially all the work on this PCB was to change some obviously broken parts and trying to reduce the vast amount of damages due to previous careless and unsuccessful repair attempt. I then set aside the two boards and started to work on the construction of a suitable CRT vector monitor. Now the vector monitor can finally display some traces as I have a working power supply and deflection system. So it's now time to power up the asteroids PCB and restore them to a fully functional state. Before continuing, let me introduce the sponsor of this video, JLC PCB. I have realized many of my projects with JLC PCB. They make good quality PCBs at amazing prices. Whether you are a hobbyist or a professional electronic engineer, JLC PCB can suit your needs for fast and high quality PCBs. You can use your favorite design tool and submit the Gerber files on their website. Or you can use the online design and simulation tools that are very convenient. Or you can simply submit the design files of any shared project. And after that you just get the PCBs delivered at your door. So be sure to check their website for latest prices and offers. The link is in the description down below. JLC PCB recommended from a long time satisfied customer. Now the first thing we need to power up the arcade PCB is of course a suitable power supply. So let's see what voltages this board needs. This wiring diagram is taken from the game service manual. Of course the first voltage needed is 5V DC for the CPU, memories and the TTL logic chips. Then there are two wires connecting any C voltage. They are labeled as 36 VAC high and 36 VAC low. This diagram is a bit misleading since it isn't telling uh, exactly what's going on. But in the original arcade game the power supply is also used for the video monitor. So let's have a look at this other wire diagram where it is also shown the power transformer. It is evident now that the 36 volts AC secondary is actually center tapped with the center tap connected to the common ground. This means that I actually need to find a power transformer with two 18 volts AC secondaries. Sometimes a project is born under a lucky star. In fact, the main transformer of the little TV set that donated the CRT for the vector monitor has exactly two 18 volts secondaries. So I started removing all unneeded parts from the old chassis, I repainted it with a few layers of white enamel and I started building the complete power supply around this metal chassis. To provide the 5V DC rail I decided to use a small PC-80X switching power supply. This one will also provide the plus 12V DC needed for my vector monitor. However, the vector monitor also needs a minus 12V DC ray, but a typical PC power supply has a very small current capability on this output. So I decided to add another small switching power supply for the minus 12V DC. This is a very cheap unit I found on eBay. However, the cheap 12V supply failed very soon when I started testing the vector deflection board. I tried to open it, but I quickly decided it was not worth to fix it. Instead, I decided to buy a much better and a bit more expensive power supply made by Minwell. Here you see the two units side by side. At this point I started assembling all the parts together. Of course I added also a good number of fuse holders to protect different rails, a power switch on the main input and a neon indicator lamp. Also I had to fabricate a few metal brackets to hold the various parts together. After connecting all main inputs I needed to check the correct facing of the 18V AC center tap. To do this 
have connected the scope ground on the common connection between the two secondaries and two probes on the other two ends of the secondaries. What we want to see is two opposite sinusoidal signals. Should the scope display only one signal, then we will need to swap only one secondary end at the common point. I've then soldered the output wires and used a plastic cover to insulate all the connections of the transformer. A few suitable connectors for the PCB edge were easily found on eBay, so I started soldering the power rails to the supply pins. And finally, I can try powering up the asteroids boards. The plan is to check with the oscilloscope whether or not the boards give any X and Y deflection outputs. Ok, the first test is surely encouraging. The power supply seems working fine so far. Another very important pin to be wired on the edge connector is the self-test switch. When this pin is connected to ground, the CPU executes a series of tests that are very useful for troubleshooting the boards. I have found an old PC key switch that fitted in one of the chassis slots, so I can even remove the key when I don't need to use the test switch. At this point I could start troubleshooting the two asteroids boards. The oldest board shows some wide deflection output. but the X deflection output shows no activity. The newer board is even worse as it shows no activity on any of the X and Y outputs. As I am editing this video, I have already fixed both boards, but each one will be covered in future videos. The Asteroids Game PCB has no VT audio power amplifier, instead it has two low-level audio outputs that form together a balanced audio signal. In the original cabinet, the power amplifier is part of the power supply board and is made with two identical single-ended integrated amplifiers that drive the speaker in push-pull mode. We notice that there is no volume control either on the game PCB or in the power amplifier board. If we look at the wiring diagram, we finally find the volume potentiometer. It is placed in the speaker circuit, effectively changing the speaker resistance. This may seem a rather strange hack, and it actually is a hack in my opinion. This solution was probably chosen because varying the signal level either at the game PCB or in the audio amplifier board would require double section ganged potentiometers, since we have to deal with two opposite signals there. I decided I would not try to replicate the original audio amplifier. I thought I could make a smaller and less powerful amplifier and also decided I would not need to use a dual potentiometer for varying the volume since I could design a dual supply amplifier because I already have plus and minus 12 volt DC rails needed for the vector deflection board. So I settled on this circuit where U1A is a different amplifier outputting a single ended signal where I can use now a normal potentiometer for volume control. U1B works as a driver for a push-pull stage made with two C-clay pairs. Then I try to add some finesse like bandwidth limits and setable current bias for the final stage. An LT spy simulation of this circuit showed no obvious problems, so I designed a PCB for it and ordered a few ones from JLC PCB. I then made a small heatsink for audio final transistors and built one board. 
However, this circuit never actually worked well. It was bursting into oscillations, it kept on randomly destroying some of the transistors, and so it was a bit of an expected failure. I then decided to keep the circuit as simple as possible. I removed any bandwidth limitation, I calculated a fixed current bias for the final stage, and got rid of every component that was not essential. The revised circuit is very similar to the first one, so I could use another PCB of the old batch with minimal modification. The new revision looked quite empty anyway. I also mounted the power transistor directly on the aluminium heatsink and I used flexible wires to connect them to the PCB because I wanted to avoid any mechanical stress on the PCB caused by thermal expansion and contraction cycles. The updated schematic worked very well from the beginning, so I could finally wire the game PCB audio outputs to the power amplifier inputs and mount the audio amplifier assembly on the main power supply chassis. It is now time to demonstrate why a balanced audio output has been used. The noise waveforms riding over both audio 1 and audio 2 outputs are very similar because it is mostly produced by noise in the gain PCB power supply that are shared with the X and Y deflection amplifiers. Since a balanced amplifier will subtract the audio 2 waveform from the audio 1 waveform, the noise will cancel out, but the actual audio signal being inverted between the two outputs will instead add up. In the following footage I've left one audio input disconnected so we can hear the difference when both inputs are used and the noise is subtracted. Of course, in real life the two noise waveforms are not exactly identical. The last thing I needed to be able to troubleshoot the game PCBs was a vector display. As everyone already guessed, I have used the oscilloscope in XY mode. Since at this stage my vector monitor project is still lacking a cathode amplifier and the associated spot killer circuit. The only problem when using an oscilloscope is that the brightness of the beam cannot easily be modulated by the game brightness output because the z-axis input on the scope is not compatible with the typical voltage of the game PCB. At the time I'm recording this video, both my Asteroids game boards have been repaired. The actual troubleshooting and repair process of both of the boards will be shown in separate videos. I hope this was an interesting video, if you have any questions please use the comment section down below. That's all for the moment and thank you for watching.